And we're back. Once again, this is Dominate the Day, God's Way, hosted by me, Sedan Long. And before we get started today, I just really want to take a few minutes and encourage you. Because we are in the toughest season of the year. Right now, this is where companies start making their cuts in the form of firings and layoffs. And also, this is the time of year where you have to start coming up with that extra money because the gas bill is going up, because you really need to buy gifts for your loved one and your children. Um, and probably the most overlooked thing is putting together that holiday meal because trying to feed a whole bunch of people is not cheap. And also, unfortunately, there are probably going to be some people who were at the table last year who aren't there this year. There are people right now that are struggling, that are struggling with the loss of a mother, a father, a sister, a daughter, a grandparent, or a spouse. And this time of year is really hard for them. And I just want to take a couple minutes to let you know that I love you and that I understand. Now, something that's really helped me and is helping me through this time of year is figuring out how to separate myself from my season. You see, what we have to do is we have to recognize that just because we're going through bad times or dealing with failures, it doesn't make us a bad person or a failure. And once we start to see ourselves as separate from the things that we've gone through, then we can actually take and have power over those things and we can start to move in the right direction. Because you can walk away from a bad situation, but you can't walk away from you. Yeah, and I know you're sitting here right now going, yeah, but you got a radio show and you're a best-selling author and you own your own company. But not too long ago, it was me getting a pink slip. It was me trying to figure out how I was going to pay my bills. It was me not able to buy my mother or my loved ones gifts during the holidays. So I know the pain of not knowing where your next paycheck is coming from. You know, I know how it feels to be in the mall or be in the grocery store and wish that you had the power to be invisible because you don't want somebody to come up to and ask you how you're doing because you don't want to tell them that you lost your job. I know how it feels to be sitting there looking at the phone trying to decide if you're going to dial or not dial because you know you need this money, but you don't really want to ask them because if you ask them, they're going to judge you. They're going to ask you a whole bunch of questions about, well, how did this happen and what did you do? And it's just going to make the situation worse. And that's why I do what I do. That's why I wrote the book, God Wants You to Dominate. That's why I speak, I teach, I coach, I train God's people. Because I never want you to feel that way again. Because see, I know once you start to see yourself different and you learn how to do it a different way and you learn how to see yourself the way God sees you, that you will become unstoppable. And that's why pastors, business owners, group owners or group members, I'm willing to come to your events. I'm willing to come to your churches your Bible studies, your morning meetings, your coffee talks, and to help coach you and teach you how to do the things necessary to change, how to take yourself from where I was, which is somebody struggling to figure out how to get out of a bad situation during a bad season, to being a best-selling author. And if you don't have a church home or you don't own a business or you're not in any of these groups, but you're tired, and you know you need help, and you know you need to change, but you don't know how, you can just go to sedanloan.com, click on the Get Started, or click on the Contact Us button, and that's going to send me an email. And what I'll do is I'll figure out with you how to support you through this season and how to help you go from dormant to dominant. So I just wanted to take a few seconds to tell you that I love you and I understand and to try to help you in whatever way I can. So today, I got another awesome guest and all my guests wear a variety of hats. Now, the guest that I have today, 
she is an educator, she's an author, she's an entrepreneur, and she is a youth advocate for over 20 years. So whether you find her helping one-on-one, -on -one, whether in a group setting, or next year finding her at the National Mentors Conference in Washington, D.C., you will find her about her father's business. So what I want you to do, Dominate Nation, I want you to help me welcome to the family, Audrey Young. Hello, 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 and good morning. Hey, Audra, how you doing? Hey, how are you? I am doing great. Awesome, awesome, awesome. That's thank good. you for having me this morning, brother. Well, thank you for coming. <laughs> Absolutely. You're busy, I see. Yes, sir. Okay, so before we get into talking about all of the stuff you do and why you do it, tell them where you're from. I'm from Gary, Indiana. Amen. Where do you go to high school? Roosevelt High School. Sorry to hear that. <laughs> oh, I don't know why. It's the only high school. <laughs> Well, that's the same thing. That Bounce I'm, back, but no. That's the same hey, thing I may have Hey, said. Gary Love. Gary Love is all about the love. No matter what high school you come from, it's all about the love. So, Amen. Thank you for having me, bro. Amen. On the show this morning. So, how did you get into the children industry and youth development? Oh, my goodness. Um, I come from a family where women were either, well, my family as a whole, you're in the medical field or you're in the educational field. Okay. But I was one of them children. I was a little crazy. Okay. You know how you put the dows in front of you and you be talking to yourself and you got the chalkboard going. Mm -hmm. And before my brother was born, my mother was like, we got to get her a brother or sister. Something's not right. She's in there talking to the dolls, uh, adding up math problems and, and thinking that they should respond. And that's how it would go. And so I just always knew it was something that I wanted to do. I wanted to be an educator. Um, and I can only remember a few to this day, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. that really, really pushed me. Mm -hmm. You know, they loved me, but at the same time, they pushed me mm -hmm. to be the best that I could be. And those are the ones that I will never forget. And I think those are the ones that we'll never forget, you know. We were like, oh, they're getting on my nerves, or they're making me sick, but those are the ones to this day, you know, they pay, They will play a vital role in, as to why you become the person that you become. Absolutely. For me, that was Father Cleary when I was in college. And literally, he would give us five books a week and ask us two questions. So I had to read five books, but he was only going to ask me two questions. So he would always mix them up. But it made me read books that I would have never otherwise read. Because most of the time, what we were doing, we were just cramming for the test. <laughs> So, you know, he helped us develop not only our work ethic, but broaden our minds, and I'm grateful for that. So, with that being said, who was the impactful teacher for you? Let's give him a little love. Oh, a shout out to Miss George at Roosevelt High School. She was my English teacher, and we would say, Vero, my girl, because we knew her first name, and she didn't, of course, we would not do that in front of her face. Amen. But behind her back, we'd be like, Vero, my girl, because she uh, made learning about Beowulf exciting you know, Shakespeare, things of those natures that children from an urban setting would not like. She broke it down and she made it fun and understandable for us. Amen. So, jo uh, Miss George at Roosevelt High School, my senior English teacher. Okay. So have you actually taught in the classroom? Have I taught in the classroom? The question is how long? I uh, graduated from Roosevelt in 90. Okay. Uh, then went on to go to Central State University, the HBCU and Central State University, that's in Ohio. Wilberforce. Uh, yeah, Wilberforce. Uh, got up my first shot at teaching in 1995 in Detroit and remained there until uh, 2016. Uh, it's funny how. Um, God has a way of putting you back where he wants you to be. Amen. Um, what steps. Yeah. I lost my mother to cancer okay. in 2016. And so if someone would have told me that I was going to end up back in Gary, I'd have been like, yeah, right. Ha. Huh. Joke. Yeah, but God and, knows what we don't. Yeah. And so I'm back home. Yeah. Well, welcome back home. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, you... You've been exposed to probably three of the toughest environments educationally in the country between Gary, Indiana, yeah. Chicago, Illinois, and Detroit. Yeah, Detroit, definitely. So what are you seeing in the classroom that we need to do differently? Um, and this is, it's funny that you say that because when I go to Washington, D.C. in January, I will be addressing how to reduce school suspension with children of color. Amen. And so our kids are coming with a lot of social maladjusted issues from day 
one. Okay. And so my thing is, you've got to bring, first of all, especially in today's time, education, don't go in it if you don't really have the well-being or the interest of children at heart. And this right. is hard enough for them already, one. Two, you've got to go in there and see from the eyes or behind the eyes of a child, mm -hmm. you know. Why, you know, there's always people assuming, you know, why is this child acting this way? Or this child is from Lucifer himself. Yeah. Whereas it's, everybody has a story. And you never know what that child went through or is going through prior to getting to school that day. You know, just probably just making it to school hey. was, a, you know, survival. Yeah. Survival for that kid, because you don't know where they had to go, where they had to walk, catch the bus, what's going on at the home front. Just it's a whole be? lot, whole lot. And so we've got to show love first of all, and we got to show more empathy. Amen. And Amen. understand, you know, if that is tough out here. A lot of kids have gone through some things that adults could not handle, nonetheless, the fact that they have to do deal with it. And you know they come with high levels of stress, and now, so we need to learn to diffuse that. <laughs> absolutely. Now this is what you do. Yeah. As you told me in our pre-interview, this is what I do. Yeah. So what are some of the techniques and tactics that you use to help kids through these situations? First of all, you have to, and I don't care whatever the environment is. Uh -huh. You've got to make it an environment of peace, love. Welcome. Well, it has to be welcome. Open arms. And it has to be loving. It has to feel. It has to be a place where people feel mutual respect and love. Amen. Love is the key. You know, if you're not getting that anywhere else, wherever the spaces that you create or wherever it may be, they got to feel that. They have to feel that. So, how do you create love in a classroom? You create first of all. You come in from a non-judgmental standpoint. Okay. Okay. So, hypothetically, let's say I got a hold of your records. Okay. And I'm saying, help me, Lord. <laughs> yeah, this, you go through the record, and whoa, how am I gonna get through this? You know what? A lot of the times, I don't even care what's on the record because every time you come in front of me or you with me, we start at a hundred percent. Amen. So you're going to get a fair chance. I don't care what it is the record said. You're going to get a fair chance with me. Yeah. And those records are kind of tricky because I worked in alternative schools for a while, and I know we would have meetings about prospective students, and you would think that we were getting John Gotti. <laughs> and then some 12-year-old kid who's 100 pounds soaking wet shows up, and he's just the sweetest kid up. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of our children don't have a chance from the start, you know, uh, it could be from parenting to being placed in different foster homes, abuse from foster homes. Absolutely. Just never having a, an adult or a role model that they can trust that won't take advantage of them. Right. You so know? how do I trust when everybody who I've ever trusted has let me down? Exactly. You know, that becomes their normal. That's right. And they're, and they're expecting you to let them down. You just, you just another person that's not going to be in my life a long time. Or you going to let me down anyway. So I might as well come in here raising pure cane. Exactly. So being in Detroit and being in Gary, you, you deal with a lot of young men as well. Yes. Okay. So for young men specifically, what are some of the things that we can do to try to encourage them? Because these young men are going to be our fathers. They're going to be, you know, in our community. And we really don't want them to be broken and not have at least some of the skills they need to survive. Sure. What a lot of young men... It's either there's no power or they, it's just a situation where they're just dealt a bad, bad hand mm -hmm. or, you know, they have to make, turn off the switch. And what I mean by turn off the switch is that they run the household, mm -hmm. you know, while mom is working, trying to make ends meet. You know, these young men are the head of the household right. and then they have to come to school and switch back to a kid. Right. And so... They have to make that adjustment, or you have a lot of children or a lot of young men who are put in adult situations, forced into it. Mm -hmm. um, prime example: I had a kid who fit 16. I'm sorry, six 17. Okay, mm -hmm. 
grades are going down, okay. right, in school, but he has no time to study because when he does go to school, he has to work to help pay bills. Right. And if he doesn't, his mother is going to put him out the house. Right. On top of the fact that the house is always loud, this baby is not getting any sleep, right. he's tired, he's working, they partying in the house all night long. And then he's got to get up and go to school. And so when he goes to school, from the teacher's perspective, he's the kid that stayed up all night that was playing around. Right. You know, should have went to bed. You're going to have to get up where this child is just simply tired because he can't be a child. Exactly. So what led you to write the books? Because I know the books speak to some of this stuff. Absolutely. They're just simply, I was one of those teachers. You know, it took me some growth. I'm like, I'm in here, I don't know what to do anymore. Mm -hmm. And you gotta remove, remember the powers that be were removed from a lot of educators. The only thing you could do or can do is put them out. Right, can't help them. No, put them out. And so it got to the point where I was like, you know what, let's sacrifice some lunch times. And what I just started doing was just inviting kids to come up, you know. Mm -hmm. This is my private time and I'm trying to get my head right, but I'm going to be crazy at the end of the year if I keep doing this. I'm losing the passion for what I once loved. I would have them come upstairs. We would eat lunch. We'd get to talking. And I wouldn't do all the talking. I would listen. Okay. I would throw up a subject matter on the board and just let them talk about it. And to the point where they were like, are we going to do lunch bunch today? And I'm like, okay, well, yeah, yeah, I guess, you know. Let's do lunch bunch. Then, you know, the trust. We became like a little club. And the next thing you know, we're trusting. We're talking about what's going on at home. Right. And then they just start to let you know, you know, when I get to school, I'm on my breaking point. Because right. this is what I've gone through prior to getting here. So it's not going to take much to set me off because I'm already here. Right. You understand? I'm so, up like this. Right. Yeah, basically. And so the kid that made the joke, it wasn't the fact that he made the joke. It was just that I, I was at my point. He made the joke at the wrong time, if right. that makes any sense. And so now we going at it. There it is. And so you have a lot of kids that are just dealing with too much. And you got to think about it now. You've been in the educational setting as well. They spend the most time with us. Right. If you with us seven hours a day, multiply that times five. You spend more time in the classroom setting or with your teacher than you really do at home. Because by the time you go home, if you do homework mm -hmm. and you, you go to bed, eat your dinner, then you're back at school. Yeah, there's no real interaction time with parents. So really you're interacting more with these teachers than and anybody school, else. Right. And yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so back to your question because I do want to answer it. You have to, children are, and young adults, and teens and tweens, what they have in common, like animals, they can see straight through you. Absolutely. They can see if they can trust you, or are you going to hurt them, are you in it for the wrong reasons, for the paycheck. You know, they can see straight through you. Right. And so the first thing that I always try to let people or my babies know is that you're safe here. Amen. So you have to set up an environment where they feel safe. Amen. This is a judge-free yeah. zone. You're loved here. Amen. Okay, but if you get out of hand, it is my job out of love to show you how to get back on the right path. Because he's chasing the one that he loved. Yeah. Absolutely. So how did you get a heart for this? I mean, because obviously you're a very bright woman, and you could have done something way easier with your life. Man, the kids just, the books are really about, I could have not wrote my books because I'm a literal person, mm -hmm. but it was my passion. And so children of Detroit Public Schools, I could have not wrote my first two books because those first two books mm -hmm. are based upon exactly what I told you what we did. We had a loving environment, a trusting environment. And then you just get to unloading. Right. You get to talking about what's going on. And so that's why the name of the first book was called The Everyday Living of Children and Teens because it is just that. Amen. Exactly. So who, is. Who, is this book, who are these books going to help the most? Oh, my goodness. They help adults. Okay. Help they them understand. Help, they help youngsters realize or identify, is this the issue or the root of the source of what I'm going through? Okay. Uh, in my first book, the very first 
act or a monologue mm -hmm. is based upon a young lady who has been abandoned by her mom. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. So, hmm. Am I going through that? Do I know someone else that's going through that? Is that the root of my source, my fear, my anger, that someone else, if I allowed an adult to get close to me, will do the same thing that my mother and my father did to me? You know? There's another one. I had a kid, I mean, and he showed out. But this baby waited all weekend for his father to show, to take him to get a haircut. His dad didn't show. But boy, when Monday came, you know who felt it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, he brought the pain back to the place. That he was that safe. He, yeah. And the odd part about it, and people have to often other times understand this, is that you're the safe place for me to unload. Mm -hmm. You know, because you're not going to beat me, you're not going to mm -hmm. punish me or impugn me in any way. So, and here, I can vent. I can right. go a little bit further with things than I would otherwise. Because if I do that at home, then I might get slapped, or I might get beaten, or I might get punished in some way. Exactly. Yeah. So how do we rewrite the story? Or how do we help our kids rewrite the story? We help story? them address it. Uh, first of all, once, it's just like a support group. Okay. You need to know you're not the only person that's going through it. Right. Or you're not the only person that will ever go through it. There, you'll go through it, and there'll be others that come behind you. So with this young lady and with this young man, they had to understand that they weren't the only children that were put in those situation or that situation. Mm -hmm. Two, it's okay. Three, it's okay to be mad about it, but it's not okay to come and raise Cain and destroy things because of that. There are ways to channel that emotion appropriately. Let's talk about it. Let's write about it. Let's address, let, let's, let's, let's ask journal. Them, so let's journal. Let's do some things that will help us now and in the long run so that in the near future when it hits us or we hit with it, we won't respond violently, if that makes any sense to you. Amen, because that just creates a spiral of other things that now you got to deal it, with. Exactly. Getting kicked out of school, being in the juvenile detention centers, being in the prison system. You know, all because you couldn't deal with some of the stresses that were happening at home. Mm -hmm. you know? And then the thing is, they're happening to all of us just at different levels yeah. and different times of our life. Uh, it's not its not about what you go through, it's how you handle what's been presented to you. It's not always uh, good, you exactly. know. We all are going to deal with some hurt and pain and agony. But it's how do we come out after going through that mm -hmm. and how do we express ourselves Amen. and we don't want to express ourselves to the point where we continue to get kicked out of school or even with our adults who've had these issues that still have them that never had them addressed can't keep a job or don't have the appropriate social skills it's time to say i this is my problem mm -hmm. now i'm ready to embrace it and deal with it you know and so we deal with the acceptance part. You got to realize that you play a part in it as well. Absolutely. That makes sense. And that's part of what you do as a business, right? <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. So tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely. I do a, a trainer training session with uh, educators and youth affiliate organizations. I actually go in, I wrote a curriculum okay. based upon the several social dynamics that children endure and go through and what they're bringing to the classroom. Mm -hmm. And what I do is I teach the teachers my curriculum on how to instruct, how to get to the root of the source of the problem, excuse me, of what's going on with the kid, with role play, meditation, writing, mm -hmm. you know, expressing yourself, but expressing yourself appropriately because they do need to be able to express themselves. They should not be told not to talk about it. Or ignore it because it's it's still in the it's gonna come out one way or the other, but it's all about delivery and the appropriate way to express yourself. Amen. So you got something coming up in January, real soon, going yeah. to D.C. Yeah, I'm going to the National Mentors Conference in um, Washington D.C. Again, I'll be talking about how to reduce school suspension. So the same thing that I do with my business, I'll be doing there. Okay. Uh, also in March, I'll be speaking at the National Bullies Conference in Reno Valley, Nevada. Mm -hmm. And it's funny that you said that because when we spoke this morning, we talked about the antagonists. Mm -hmm. 
Right. And that's exactly what my seminar is going to be on, uh, what makes a bully a bully. Yeah. And so I'll be talking about that. Okay. So how do people get in touch with you? Because obviously what you do is very valuable, especially in the times that we're in currently. So how do you get in touch with you? Sure. You can log on to www.ardannyl.com. Again, www.ardannyl.com. Thank you so much for having me today. It is been <laughs> great. And I really value what you do. I think that people need to get involved and support you because obviously our kids need the mentoring. They need the skills. They need the things necessary to make them whole. Um, I watched Jay-Z the other night in his interview with the New York Times, and, and he was talking about the same stuff that we're talking about. So you have to see that this is a, a national thing. This isn't just a local thing. So if you had one thing that you would tell parents at home that they could do right now to help their kids going forward on Monday, what would it be? Listen and ask questions. Dig deep. You know, all this, I don't agree with this privacy. You know, there should be a limit to the privacy because I'm one of them parents, if I send something, I'm going to go through drawers. Ain't going to be too many tabs where that door is closed and I don't see what's going on with you with the rate of suicide going up. It's out of blood. Talk to me. How did your day go? Did you feel comfortable? Is anybody antagonizing you? Are you feeling comfortable in your subject? So just simply asking those questions every day and noticing the shift in a pattern of your child. Like my kid was once happy. All of a sudden he's uh, introverted, don't want to be around anybody. Right. You know, if it's an elongated pattern of that, something nine times out of ten is going on. Okay. Well, guys, it has been another wonderful show. And as always... Make sure that you reach out and follow me on social media. I'm Sedan Long everywhere. Um, don't forget on Monday to run with Rand and kick it with Kim right here on Truth Is Ministries on this station at 7 p.m. And as always, like I say, to those who have been given dominion, they were born to dominate, and I'm out. Dominate the day God's way to follow Mr. Sedan. <laughs> there you go. Sedan Thank you. On Instagram, we got to get Twitter. Twitter.